So then, brothers and sisters, we will open up God's Word. We're reading to you a couple of portions. One will be from Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20, which you can find on page 988 and 989 in our Pew Bibles, as well as Acts 2, 37 through 47 which you can find on page 1079 in our Pew Bibles. And if you're able, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always. To the very end of the age. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because of the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, saying, Save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give it to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together at the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. May God bless the reading of his word to your soul. You may be seated. Amen. So we're continuing looking at the Baptist Confession of 1689 articles this morning. Uh, coupling in the beginning here, just Article 28 and 29, which is entitled uh, Baptism in the Lord's Supper, and then we'll look at specifically baptism for the most part here. Um, the title of the message this morning is Celebrating Our Fellowship with Christ, and I put in parentheses in your bulletin, if you got a bulletin, Communion of Saints, which is what we were looking at last week, the fellowship that we have as a local particular body of Christ out of the local church and we were celebrating the uh, scriptural basis for that and the importance of that and the blessing of being part of a local church. Um, the central idea this morning is, as it relates to that, baptism is a sign of a believer's fellowship with Christ. It's a, an identification with a believer makes with, uh, with Christ. It's, it's a uh, picture of that, a sign of believers' fellowship with Christ, and also his church, because it's um, offered in the context of, uh, of the church. 
So kind of just a quick little introduction here as we tie the two ordinances together. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are the two ordinances of the church that are to be participated in on a regular basis by the church, by the communion of saints, by the body, the local body of Christ. Uh, both ordinances to be participated in on a regular basis. It's part of what is uh, the privilege of being part of of being a member of, of a local church. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26, says, For often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And we celebrate that monthly here and sometimes on other special occasions. And um, we'll be looking at that ordinance, Lord willing, next week. And then the ordinance for baptism, in part, was... The verse that John read there in Matthew 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So these two ordinances are to be done in remembrance of Christ, His sacrifice, and of His return. In the article under Baptism and the Lord's Supper, uh, number one says, Baptism and the Lord's Supper are ordinances of positive and sovereign institution appointed by the Lord Jesus Christ, the only lawgiver to be continued in his church to the end of the world. Those two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. The privilege of being able to participate and share in both of those. And I'll say more about this next week, hopefully, but I will just say now, if necessary, if there's extraordinary circumstances and a person is unable to be in church, celebrating the ordinance of baptism, Brother John and I will bring the ordinance to you. That's how important that we feel that it is as it relates to its part of being in the fellowship of the church. It's part of being fellowship of the local church. So we'd love to bring it to you if for extraordinary reasons you're not able to be uh, with us for worship. And I'm talking about on a regular basis. Okay. So, because baptism is a sign of fellowship with Christ in His church, we're looking at uh, these verses in Acts. We're going to see the command of baptism, the commission of baptism, and the compliance of baptism. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just thank You and praise You for the opportunity to uh, look at Your Word, to share Your Word, proclaim Your Word, hear Your Word, Lord. And we just pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us and lead us as we hear about baptism, but more importantly, I think what we always hear about and focus on is the Lord Jesus Christ and our relationship with Him. So what's the significance of baptism as it relates to our relationship with Jesus Christ? That's what we celebrate in this ordinance, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So because baptism is a sign of fellowship, with Christ and His church, we see the command of baptism. Verse, uh, Acts 2, 37, 38. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them in verse 38, Here's the command. Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, when they heard this, and this, Acts chapter 2, please make sure you read Acts chapter 2 uh, in its entirety at some point today. Acts chapter 2, as you know, is the birth of the church. We got the day of Pentecost here in Acts 2, 1 through 13. The birth of the church, and now we got Peter's, it really is the first Christian sermon given by Peter here in Acts 2, 14 through really 47. And in that, why they, when they heard this, it says they were pierced to the heart. Why were they pierced to the heart? Peter had presented the gospel to them there in these verses. And Peter had said, can you imagine saying to the people there, Jews that assembled there, and saying to them, you are responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. You are responsible. You killed the Messiah. You are responsible for having him nailed to the cross 
and killed. And there's an element, of course, where we're personally responsible in the sense that he died for all those who would believe and trust in him. And so, I don't know what I would have... You think about if you were standing there and they hear the sermon, they hear Peter saying that, what would you think the next thing would be that would happen? You're responsible for the death of Jesus. You're responsible for the killing of the Messiah. Okay, now what? Jail. <laughs> Jail, death, struck down dead, now what? And in and verses 22 through 24, it says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in, the midst, in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man was delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God, see that's the beautiful part right here of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's always hope. I think we're thankful that it didn't just end with you killed Jesus, jail next, or death next. But God raised him up again putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. And the point here, again, the hope of Christ, the hope of the resurrection, you killed him, you nailed him, but he's alive. Now what do we do? When they heard this, it says they were pierced to the heart, like, uh, like, like stabbed to the heart, uh, pierced. It's the only time that word appears in the New Testament. And it means to stab, it, to pick something sudden and unexpected. I don't know, you could equate, we could equate to like when we get some sudden news or some sudden bad news or it's like, wow, we just are cut to the quick, cut to the heart. Here is describing the pain associated with this and with anxiety over it and remorse over it. And what shall we do now? It's hopeless, right? And Peter said to the rest, to, to them, to the rest of the apostles, brethren, they said, they said, brethren, what shall we do? That's probably the most monumental question that anybody could ask. Other places, you know, we would say, what must I do to be saved? Cut to the heart, cut to the quick, brethren, what shall we do? And when a person is willing to ask that question, they're on the road to salvation. They're on the road to giving evidence that their heart has been opened by the Lord and that they are being saved. So Peter says to them, repent. That word, change of direction, repentance is just not regret over, gee, I we mean, killed the Messiah. Wow. Man. Not just sorrow, but something that leads to a change of action a change of direction. Classic example in the scripture of someone who had worldly sorrow. I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 7, 10 in a minute. Was You contrast Peter and Judas. Peter's response there when he had denied the Lord three times. Right? You know that account. And you just imagine on the third time his eyes just met with Jesus and Jesus just looked at him. Prior to that, Jesus had said to him, I prayed for you, and when you are restored and come to your senses, go strengthen and go tell my brothers. Go tell the brethren. You imagine that look, that look of Jesus. And that you could we could equate that to, to our own lives at times, just your you sin. You, and then there's that look of Jesus. So what's the what does that look to Jesus? or the sight of Jesus do. In the life of the believer, in the life of the one who's saved, that look at Jesus leads to confession, repentance, godly sorrow, right? To the unsaved person, to the unbeliever, it doesn't have that effect. It, le it can lead to uh, worldly sorrow, like Judas. He had worldly sorrow, and we know what the end of his faith was. He had worldly sorrow. He didn't have godly sorrow. Peter had world, uh, godly sorrow that led to repentance. Jesus is always calling. Jesus is always drawing a person to himself. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. I'll 
I'll start with uh, verse 9. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. So godly sorrow exhibited through repentance leads to salvation. But the sorrow of the world, worldly sorrow, Judas's sorrow, leads to, produces death. So Peter's command here, the command for baptism is repent. And again, when we say repentance, it's a turning to Christ for salvation, for forgiveness of sin, for recognition of one's sin, turning to him, placing one's faith and trust in him as the, the one who bore their sin and saved them from their sin. And then in the Christian life, there's a continuous repentance, as, as we know as well. Repent, command to repent, command to, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. So you know, baptism is that outward act that shows the obedience on the heart of the person who's turned to Jesus Christ for salvation and forgiveness of sin. The salvation and forgiveness of sin has already occurred, they've already been saved, they've already been born again, they profess that, they've confessed that, and now they are expressing that to the church and to the world, whoever will witness it, they're expressing there through the act of, through the obedience, through baptism, they're expressing and showing publicly their uh, trust and faith in Christ, that they have placed their faith and trust in Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. In the years that I've been here, sometimes people get, you know, like a little freaky with the baptism and, oh, I don't want to say anything, or what should I say, and I know, and we encourage them to share a scripture or share some testimony of how the Lord brought them uh, to Christ. And, and sometimes there's a little bit of fear there. And I'm saying that because can you imagine the Jews of Jesus' day now identifying themselves through baptism, that they are disciples and followers of Christ? They've already seen what happened to Jesus. And they've already, you know, the, the disciples were, you know, hiding in the upper room and they're being hunted down and great persecution was going to come at some point. You imagine the, now they're, they're identifying, and that's what baptism is, identifying public identification of someone that they're a follower of Jesus Christ and all that that means. So because baptism is a sign of fellowship with Christ in his church, we see that, the command, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because it's a sign of fellowship, we see the commission of baptism. Here, um, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise in verse 39 is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And the, the commission of baptism goes along with Matthew 28, 19-20. Go, church, and this is the birth of the church. So this is the beginning of the church at Jerusalem. And yes, in the scripture, there are clearly identified churches. That's what the letters were that Paul had written to. And there's, again, we don't have to cross that bridge again. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. But I'm amazed. In today's day and age, sometimes I have to discuss with people about that, that membership in local churches and church is biblical. It's like, we entitled the message last week Cowboy Christianity because it's like there's people that don't want to accept that ministry of the local church and they want to just go off and kind of do um, their own thing. So the, the commission to go therefore and make disciples of all the nations is given to the church, right? And so we're, we're starting to see that here in these verses that are coming up. Verse 40 is going to say that as well about and with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them to be saved from this perverse generation, the message that goes out. But what about this promise here? It says, for the promise is for you and for your children. Back in 38, 
The promise is that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let me back up just for a second. Imagine you killed Jesus, you're responsible for his death, and then there's hope. Right? Incredible as it appeared, Peter told him there was hope even now. In the promise here, you will receive forgiveness, you will receive the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 8, verse 9, we have uh, references to the Holy Spirit as it relates to this. It says, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. How does the Spirit of God dwell in a person? How does a person receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? Here as we're talking about in the context of salvation and forgiveness of sin. And just like baptism was an outward sign of evidence that a person was a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, the gift in the presence of the Holy Spirit is a, sort of an inward um, sign, an inward uh, source of assurance and comfort for the believer that they have received Christ, because the Bible says in Acts, Romans 8, 9, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. So how does a person receive the Spirit of Christ when they're saved? That's, that's, that's what that's, that's called, that new birth, that, that being born again, from the resurrection from the dead, and, and Christ, you know, you see it in John 14, 15, 16, he sent the Holy Spirit to be in his disciples to dwell in them. Prior to this, you know, he was telling me he was going to depart, he was going to be crucified, he was going to die, he was going to leave them, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to be with you always, even to the end of time. One of my favorite verses, Matthew 28, 20. It's part of the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. As we're looking at this commission of baptism and the, and the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, inviting people to turn to him to be saved. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1 speaks of the Holy Spirit as that uh, down payment uh, on eternity, so to speak. Okay? Ephesians 1.13 says, In him you also, after listening to the message of the truth, like they did there, they, they heard the message of the truth, they heard that they had sinned, they heard that they were responsible for the death of Jesus, they heard the message of the truth, and then they said, well, what shall we do now? Repent and be baptized. They heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, it says in Ephesians 1.13. Having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's just so exciting. You'll be, you know, the believers given the Holy Spirit of promise. They're sealed now in Christ. It's like, you know, the authenticity of, uh, on, a, on a legal document or the, you know, like you get certain documents, you got the seal of the state of Connecticut, like when we adopted some children, you got like, stamp that steel on it, that this was a done deal, and those children whose name prior was some other name were now given and had the last name Stephen and was even changed on their birth certificate where they were born to whoever their parents were, earthly, and their name was there, and then after the adoption became official and sealed in the state, then they send you a new birth certificate, and it says, born to John and Cheryl Stephen with our address and, and the names of the, of the children. That's that seal, that seal of authenticity, um, a down payment on what's going to come, which is more, of it, more intimacy and enjoyment with God. It says in Ephesians 1.14, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own people, to the praise and glory of his name. So he says, if you repent and are baptized, if you're saved, if you're born again, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, you'll receive the Spirit of Jesus Christ, he'll come and he'll indwell you, and he will be with you. When, the, when Jesus says, I am with you always, even to the end of time, it's the, it's the manifestation of that third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, that is with us, in us, indwells us. It's the, it's the basis for which we have fellowship and a relationship with Jesus Christ. He says, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. All who are far off. Hmm. Do we have any here this morning that they would say, you know, they're far off? 
Or are, they, are the people here as many as the Lord our God will call to himself? You're either part of the far off group, the unsaved group, the unregenerate group, the group that is trusting and depending on something other than Jesus Christ for salvation and forgiveness of sin, far off, or amongst the many whom the Lord has called, who has quickened to himself. We'll hit that a little bit more um, later. This commission of baptism with many other words in verse 40. He solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, be saved from this perverse generation. That's the commission of baptism. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of time. And actually before that, in verse 18, it says, from my authority, the authority that we have to go and proclaim this message and the commission that we have from God comes from Christ himself. So Peter is exhorting them with diligence to save themselves from ruin. And the commission of baptism, I already kind of said this, right? The commission of baptism, coupled with the command to be baptized, was given to the church. And it was the birth of the church, as I said earlier, that was taking place here in Acts chapter 2. Article 28 on baptism and the Lord's Supper Number two has something that I want to kind of hit on just a little bit more. I kind of just said it, but this says it so succinctly. Referring to baptism and the Lord's Supper. These holy appointments are to be administered by certain people. I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. These holy ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper, are to be administered only by those who are qualified and called to administer them according to the commission of Christ. We have the commission there in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. This baptism in the Lord's Supper is to be administered in the context of the church, of the local church. There's baptisms that occur on the mission field that's certainly legitimate. It's, it's, it's disciples being made. It's the gospel call going out on the mission field to a person to be saved. But rest assured, you would also see in many of those instances where it's being done rightly and biblically. They're not just baptized. You just, see ya. That's good. You were baptized. See ya. No, there's a connection to, even, on, even in missions, to a church to a local church. So these these uh, ordinances are to be administered and by those who are called and qualified to administer them according to the commission of Christ and that being called and qualified comes in the context of the local church. That's what the scriptures teach. So because baptism is a sign of fellowship with Christ and his church, we saw the um, command of baptism. Now the compliance of baptism in verse 41. So then, I always like the so then of the scripture. Okay, now, so what? Now what? Repent to be baptized. What are you going to do? You're just responsible for the death of Jesus. So then, those who had, it's as simple as, received his word, they were baptized. And that day, there were added about 3,000 souls. Those who had received his word were baptized. The word received there in the original means to receive the word with pleasure, with delight, to accept what is offered. Have you received God's word that, in that way, the gospel in that way? I've, I've, I've shared this illustration before. I told you that when I go to, um, I go in particular to Middlebury Convalescent Home each month, and to a smaller degree when I go and share a Bible study with uh, the ladies at Woodside, some in that group are unsaved, but especially when I go to Middlebury and Convalescent Home, I'll ask the people in the crowd, usually at some point, how many Catholics in the room, and that's always the majority. How many Congregationalists here? And that's the Congregationalist, Episcopalian, Lutheran, they're like kind of tied, they're like the second and then I'll say how many Baptists and usually there's one lady 
and um, she's always in my, my little cheering section, so to speak. And, and so, but my point to them is, and I do, I've said this before, my point to them, to them is they've grown up in the church, so to speak, right? They've grown up in the church. They hear about heaven. They hear about hell. And I say to them, you've heard Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. You've heard that if you were in the Catholic Church. You heard that every week, as I've heard that every week. And I say, but some. And, I, and so I just try to find common ground with them each time that I go. And every time I go, I say, so not every time, but the point is, well, what are we going to talk about? What am I going to share with you? And the other lady in my sharing section, Johanna, goes, Jesus. You're going to share to us about Jesus. And I go, that's right. Each time I come, I'm blessed to be able to tell you about Jesus. You've heard about him in catechism. You've heard about him in Sunday school. And, and maybe you don't understand or know him in this personal kind of way. And we talk about this, that uh, salvation is a gift to be received. The word of God goes forth. The person can receive it by faith. And that happens when you move from he's the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world to I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What must I do to be saved? Please take away and cleanse me of my sins. And so we share things like that. Have you received the gospel in that way? Personally. To you. And what accompanies a person's receiving Christ is, the Bible says there's a repentance when the person hears the word, recognizes the word, recognizes that they have sinned, recognizing that they need Jesus, recognizing that they're the person in need of salvation and forgiveness of sin. And then there's a turning to him in repentance and faith and followed by the profession of their faith through the ordinance of baptism. So in the, in the book of Acts, it's, it's always repentance and baptism. And in the book of Acts, it's like immediate. It's like pretty closely following the person's profession of faith. There was no probationary period there uh, to see, well, are they hit or did they see, or did they really, or are they sincere? There's, it's, it's repentance followed by baptism, obedience through baptism. Article 29 on baptism says it just so wonderfully. Baptism is an ordinance of the New Testament ordained by Jesus Christ to be to the person who is baptized a sign of his fellowship with Christ in his death and resurrection, and this is so beautiful, of his being grafted into Christ, of remission of sins, and of that person's giving up of himself to God through Jesus Christ to live and to walk in newness of life. You know, I wasn't going to read this, but Romans, I should have, should have intended to read it, but I will read it. Romans 6, 3-5. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So we know that that baptism, the outward the, the baptism, believer's baptism is a picture of a sign of the fellowship that the person has with Christ. And they're buried with him in baptism, they go into the water, they're raised to walk in newness of life. Probably the thought there is why the name of the church is the church of new life. Raised to walk in newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Continue with Article 29, number 2. Who can be baptized? Those who actually profess repentance toward God faith in the obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ are the only proper subjects for this ordinance. The outward element is to be used is the, in this ordinance uh, is water which the person is baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Immersion, which is what the next part of this article brings out. Let me read it. Immersion, the dipping of the person in water, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life, is necessary for the true administration of this ordinance. 
the true, right, biblical demonstration, administration of this article, of this article of this ordinance, baptism, is by immersion, proper vote, versus infant baptism. If I ask them right now who's been baptized as an infant, I bet everybody in the mostly everybody in here would raise their hand if they were baptized as an infant, whether it was in the Catholic Church, the Episcopal Church, the Congregational Church, the Methodist Church, or the Lutheran Church. Um, the Bible says the proper means for this is um, through water, through the immersion in water, and based upon a person's profession and faith in Jesus Christ. Right? Mom, in 1989, 1990 or 89, Mom, I want you to come to my baptismal service at, at the church in Southbury that we were going to. I'm not going to that. Mom, why aren't you going to that? You know what I'm going to say. You were baptized as a baby. What are you saying? And basically the focus was, what I did wasn't right. What I did wasn't enough. What I... And I go, well, no, yeah, it really wasn't. And I would share the gospel and I would explain why baptism, by immersion, and based upon my profession of faith in Jesus Christ. Now I said, you baptized me, that was good. I appreciate you, you know, had faith, but the, you know, it's it's a personal faith. I'm not going. I won't tell. I'll tell you off camera. Just not to step on any kind of toes. I'll tell you off camera what I said to her after that. Okay, if you want to know, ask me off camera, say, what did you say? I said, I'm not going to say it, because it might offend some people that might watch it on film. Just ask you later, why? So what did you say to her? How did you get Because she came reluctantly. And I, so I won't, I won't say why. But she came reluctantly to witness that. In the middle of the winter, actually in a snowstorm, and they, didn't, they wouldn't drive for the possibility of a flake. And there were multiple flakes that day. And they came and witnessed it, and uh, we moved on from that. And they were supportive afterwards of my newfound faith in the Lord and all the different things that have led to that. So, immersion, form of baptism from the scripture. So let's apply this a little bit more as we um, move on. Because baptism is a sign of fellowship with Christ and his church, an obvious application question would be, is God, first of all, forget about, apart from the baptism that's coming, is God calling me, application here would be, brethren, what must I do to be saved? Uh, is God calling me to salvation through Christ? Is he calling me to publicly express, I com confess my sin, and, and publicly express my uh, commitment to follow Jesus and that I'm repenting and and yeah, I, I realize there's a good moral code that I could follow, and religion's kind of nice, and you know I could be a better person overall, you know, whatever. But but I, I might have you repented and turned to Christ for forgiveness of your sin. That's the call. Mark sixteen sixteen says, "He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved." So that's a, a promise. You shall be saved. There's no, well, was I saved? I hope I'm saved. Or I, I, I follow, I do these things and I'll be saved. It's a promise. You shall be saved. That's the good news. And that's the good news is, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Can you imagine hearing the gospel in church, wherever you are at home, family, um, hearing it regularly, and hearing it week after week, and hearing it, and not trusting in him to save you, disbelieving. The Bible says you continue in that state of disbelief, you will be condemned. It says there's eternal life in Christ, is eternal. And I say this to the ladies at Woodside, and they are look very coverless, and I don't have to choose. I say it nicely and lovingly, and you know, I say it in, in kindness, but I can say, yeah, there's eternal life with Jesus, so there's eternal death and hell apart from Jesus. And they're like, they accept that there's hell. And I always tell them, 10 years from now, they probably wouldn't even let somebody like me go over there, but 10 years from now, or shorter, the people sitting there will have no clue about 
the things of the Word of God and the things of the Lord. So is he calling you to salvation through Christ? Acts 18.8 says it as well. Let me read that. Acts 18, verse uh, 8. Yeah, 8. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. You see the relationship between the two. And I love Acts 16, 11 through 15. Let me read this. This gives such a great illustration of the call to salvation through Jesus Christ, uh, obedience to that call, to turn to him in repentance and faith to be saved, and then followed with baptism. But, so, putting out to sea from Troas, we ran straight of course to Samothrace, and on that day followed to Neapolis. This is Paul on a missionary journey. Um, Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. And from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman cohort, a Roman colony, and we were staying in this city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer, and we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled there. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. Let me stop there. I love that. A worshiper of God was worshiping. But there's more to it because the next part is very important. She was a worshiper of God. She was a religious person. She would have said, yeah, I believe in God. Or I believe in God. That's why we were going to sing, I believe in him. Of course, we were about to sing. It got cut. I think that I think it's been getting cut off all week. Because my internet hasn't been working. It's been on and off like all week. Anyways, she was a worshiper of God, but something else needed to still happen to her. It says here in this verse, a worshiper of God who was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken of by Paul. That's how a person is saved. We say over and over and over and over and time and time again. The Lord has to open their heart to be saved. A worshiper of God, acknowledged God on some level, knew he was the Lamb of God, and took away the sins of the world. I don't know what else she knew. She knew stuff, and she's worshiping God, but the Lord had to open her heart to receive the things of what Paul was saying. What was Paul saying is Jesus Christ is the Savior. Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin. Turn to him in repentance and faith and be saved. Repent, as it says in Acts 3.19, or perish. Turn to Jesus Christ, the gospel, the good news, be saved. And it said the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things by Paul. That's how someone's saved. Is God calling me to salvation through Christ today? Is God opening someone's heart today? And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you'll have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay in my house. And she prevailed upon us. Is God calling me to salvation through Christ? Is he opening your heart to receive him? Is there any light there? Just a little, even little bit of light. The Bible says even there's just a little bit of light. The one who is not the Lord's hates the light and won't come into the light because they love their darkness. But the invitation is come into the light of Christ through Jesus Christ. Is there anyone here this morning who's afar off? I kind of read that in Acts 2, 39, where it says he called. That's good in the sense if you're far off because there's a promise offered to you. It said if you recognize you're far off, it's good. There's many unsaved people walking around on the planet that are not recognized they're far off. They don't recognize they're unsaved. They don't recognize they're not the Lord's. They don't recognize that they're heaping wrath upon themselves for the day of judgment. For the promise is for those, you and your children, who are far off. So it's okay to be far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. There's a recognition that the person is far off, and then the recognition prompts, what must I do to be saved? And that prompts, repent and be baptized, and that prompts the confession of Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, as we see in Romans 10, 9 through 13. Let me read that. Anyone will confess? Let me read that. What does it say? The word is near you. You can be far off. The word is near you. 
in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Promise. Promise. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. Here's another promise for whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Will you call upon the name of the Lord and be saved? So he had come in Luke 15, 20, it says, so he got up and came to his father. This is the prodigal son. Sometimes you can be a prodigal and you can be far off. Okay? It says, so he got up and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion for him, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven, I've sinned in your sight, I've sinned against you. And the account goes on, and half a beast is killed in fact. Yeah. That's that illustration there. And the father there is a picture of what God is. He goes after the lost sheep. He goes after those who are far off. He's looking out the window. Where is my son? Are they going to come back? He stretches out his neck. He sees them. Right? And it's said there. I, I like that. Uh, where is that? Where is that part? Wait, so he got up, came to his father. Father saw him, felt compassion for him. Oh, yeah, I knew it said it there. Getting a little advanced in age. And he ran and embraced him and kissed him. When an older person runs, it's not so pretty. It's not as pretty as it was when you were 25, you know. So, you got, so he's got to pull up the robe. And sometimes I do like a little medium kind of sort of little job that they got knee problems and I want, I'm going for the walk. And sometimes I'll do a little teeny bite, a little bit of a jog, and my kids go, yeah, that's, yeah, what are you doing? I go, I'm running. They go, I don't think that's running. <laughs> and that's that picture. He ran after him and embraced him. They got, the sun is far off. And that's what Jesus Christ does for those who will call upon him. So church, do we have a sense of urgency to share this gospel with others? This is application, right? Do we have this sense of urgency? And I got an illustration of that. Is it, is it here? Yeah, it's coming. It's it like, whoa. Acts 2 4, he says, and with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them be saved from this perverse generation. There's an urgency here in the gospel going out. There's an urgency and a concern for the lost. There's a concern for the unsaved in that commission of baptism. And um, do we have that same sense of? urgency, you know, how much are we praying? I, I was convicted, I haven't done it yet, but I mean, I don't say people that I'm praying for, I said, and some of you already have a list of unsaved people that you're praying for, and I confess I don't have a list of unsaved people that I'm praying for, and I was like, write them all down, write them all down, and pray regularly, regularly for them, those that are unsaved. Therefore, it says, we are ambassadors for Christ. And so God, we're making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. There is that sense of urgency. So it sounds intense, right? It sounds, yeah, urgency, yeah. I'm going to share, yeah, I'm going to witness, I'm going to share the gospel. And there's parts of that. That's, that's important, that's true. And then there's this illustration. I was at um, the high school track in the town, and I go there with... The little ones, we throw the football, we run down the field, I throw them the ball, we go up to the baseball field, we play baseball, all that. There's this man that's walking on the track. And I saw him there once before, but this particular time he comes up to me, and I was with the three little ones, and he goes to Kenny, Kenny, I want to tell you something. He goes, and I was like standing a little away, their way. He goes, but wait, I want your father to hear this. I want your father to hear this because he's the head of your home. He's the leader of your home. I want him to hear this. In other words, I'm going to speak to you, but I'm not usurping the authority of your father. And all the man said was, Kenny, 
I want to tell you something. It's like, wow. Jesus Christ loves you. Jesus Christ died for your sins. I know he died for my sins. I know he saved me. And he said a couple of little things like that. And then that was it. And I regret he didn't go out and say, where am I? Brother, thank you. you know, I said, well, thank you for sharing that with him. And I regret that I didn't say, wait, you know, say more to him. And we left shortly after that. But he's sharing the gospel, just, right? Just, and he had such, I got to tell you, he had, he had such a peace over him. And I saw him before, and I might have been like frazzled because my kids were being their kids. And he goes, oh, what a blessing. What a blessing for you to be out here with these little ones. He goes, they're sooner or later they're going to be older. I know mine are older and they're gone, and that's a whole other thing. He goes, but what a blessing. And even that day, he was 95 degrees. I'm like, Sam, I'm like, I don't want to go to the football. We're going to bake on that field. And I go to the guy, yeah, it's really hot. No, it's just a great and beautiful day. He goes to be out here and enjoying God's creation. And then he left, and after he left, he walked around in every piece of garbage that he saw on the side of the field. He just walked over, put it in the garbage can, can but walked over, put it in the garbage can. And I'm convinced if I see him again, I'm quite convinced if I would ask him, he would say, I'm praying for that school, and I'm praying for the salvation of the souls of the people there as I'm walking through the athletic field. There was a sense of urgency, right, that he had to share the gospel. Is God calling me application? Is God calling me to the obedience of believers' baptism? Okay, we're almost done. Acts 2, 41 says again, um, that day they received his word, they were baptized. 3,000 souls were added that day. Acts 22, verse 16 I like this one too. Why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Acts 22, verse 16. Acts 8, 11 through 12. God calling someone to believers baptism. Acts 8, 11 through 12. And they were giving him attention. That's the wrong one. Oh, no, okay. But they believed, still preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, and they were baptized men and women of life. And so again, that's what you see throughout Scripture. That'll be an application point. And then I'll put this last application in. It ties this into the church again. Is God calling me to the obedience of membership in a local particular body of Christ? We had the messages the last couple of weeks on the church and on the communion of saints. And so again, this ordinance is done in the context of the church. Yeah, it's done on the mission field. It's done in the context of the church, the authority of the church, the authority of a, of a, of a, of a missionary. In the context of the church, is God calling me to um, membership in this particular church? Article 26, the one on the church. Let's go back to that. And let me just read that, and then we will... Article 26, number 20. All believers are bound. We covered this when we did this. Actually, Brother John did this message, and I did communion with the saints, which tied the two together. But all believers are bound to join themselves to a particular churches where, when and where, they have opportunity to do so. And all who are admitted to the privileges of the church are under the, the censors and government of that church in accordance with the rule of of Christ. Baptism, the Lord's Supper, those ordinances elevate the local church and what God says, God shares as it relates to the church. It elevates Jesus Christ first and foremost. Baptism is a sign of believers' fellowship with Christ. We saw the command, the commission, the compliance. So the last question could be what what it says here in verse 37. Brethren, what shall we do? How is God calling you to respond to the command to be baptized? How is God calling you to respond to the uh, commission to share the gospel, to share the good news? How is God calling you personally to? Is he calling you personally to turn to Christ to be saved? Is he calling us as a church? Yes, of course, to be witnesses, to be uh, intentional, to be, 
I just loved how natural that guy was. Just, you know, we have people in our church who do that as well. But when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said, Brethren, what shall we do to be saved? That's a good pierced piercing to the heart. There's another example in the scripture as we're closing of a piercing to the heart that led to a different response. Here we got the piercing of the heart that led to godly sorrow that led to repentance. Same gospel was proclaimed in Acts chapter 7 with Stephen um, when he's being stoned to death, before he's being stoned to death and being killed. The same gospel message went out just as it went out in the book of Acts. Read Acts 2 and read Acts 7 um, later on today. Acts 7, 54 says, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick. I'm just always amazed. It's the same response. They're cut to the quick. They're stabbed to the heart. The gospel just went forth. We heard the good news of salvation of Jesus Christ. We heard that he's the way, the truth, and the life. We heard that repent and turn to him and be saved. They're cut. They're stabbed. They're cut to the heart. And their response after that was, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. Stephen, gnashing their teeth at him. No repent, hatred to the, to the message. No godly sorrow that led to repentance. Matthew 3, 16 through 17. Put this in here. Oh, we forgot the screen back up. All right, I was going to tell you to get ready for the quote for the week. Matthew 3, 16 and 17 says, well, yeah, 16 and 17. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting, lightning, lightning on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. So you got the example there, the picture of them, Jesus being baptized. That's part of that commission, him coming and being the Savior of him. Submitting to baptism is a good thing for us to remember, to follow the Lord in obedience. And I think you could couple that with John chapter 2 with the bed of Canaan, where the mother, and they're running out of water, uh, wine, and the mother says to them, just do what he says. <laughs> do what he says. Do what he says. Follow the Lord's example. Follow the Lord in obedience to what his word says. All right, Daniel, quote for the week. Matthew Henry wrote, They were baptized, believing with the heart, 